Well, welcome to the museum. Um, I'm Hadley German, the associate curator, and I'm so glad that you're here today. Bragdon gives us a lecture about his uncle, Langdon Keene. And I have a few words of introduction about um, Dr. Bragdon, which I think is important. So, Dr. Bragdon is an emeritus professor from Florida Institute of Technology with more than 40 years of academic research and consulting experience in the fields of urban planning, transportation, homeland security, cybersecurity, and more. He, is, he has served as a distinguished professor, dean, vice president, and assistant to the president of Georgia Institute of Technology, Florida Atlantic University, Dowling College, and Florida Institute of Technology. As the current president of the Global Center, a think tank dedicated to preparation and response to natural and human disasters, Dr. Bragdon has authored myriad books and more than 100 articles and lectured internationally. So we're very pleased to have you here today. Okay. He has served as a media consultant to CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, Fox, NPR, The New York Times, and USA Today. But today, he's joining us to speak about a very different perhaps more personal subject. That is the life and work of his uncle, the artist Langdon Keene. This is not the first time Dr. Bragdon has presented on the subject. In 2014, he co-curated Langdon Keene, An American Story, an exhibition at the Fusner Museum in Melbourne, Florida. Dr. Bragdon was fortunate enough to have two uncles of renown, Langdon Keene and his great uncle, Ernest Hemingway. However, he recalls that Langdon Keene was the uncle he grew closest to and loved as a child. It's an honor to have him here sharing Langdon Keene's story with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bragdon to the stage. Well, thank you very much. I want to indicate that uh, my first contact with the University of Oklahoma was with Hadley. And it was interesting because I asked her in my first conversation with her, Hadley, where did you get that name? My mother. And I said, well, why Hadley? She says, well, she loved Hadley Hemingway. And I said, that's my great aunt. From then on, it was perfect. And I want to thank her for inviting me in the, the museum group. But I also want to put a plug in at the bottom left, because tomorrow is the opening day of a very significant show called Ticket to Ride. And uh, I think that will be very, very exciting for a lot of people. You'll notice that there's a W in front of Landon Keene. I'll tell you a story that very few people know. He hated the name Wilford. He never used it. So every painting, if he used, if he signed, it was W. Lennon Keene. We called him Uncle Billy. He loved that because he loved us as a family. But he never told that story to anybody. So now you've heard it for the first time. OK, moving from there, let me see if I can get things going here. Uh, these are some of the paintings that are in museums. He has his paintings in over 100 museums throughout the world. And um, the one on the right happens to be from Vancouver. The one on the left happens to be with the National Geographic collection. Now, I want to mention one thing about the National Geographic. Here's a question. What is the largest collection of art in the world? What building or what institution has it? Raise your hand. Or say it. Wrong. Another one? Wrong. I haven't heard St. Petersburg yet. How about St. Petersburg? The largest collection of art is the National, Ga uh, National uh, Geographic Museum. Now, you know how many pieces they have in their collection? Eight million all in, New in Washington, D.C., and we had a chance to go through it to see some of the Keene works, among other things. So it's a little hidden thing that the curator doesn't want anybody to know about because he holds them like a deck of cards. Anyway, that's a little introduction, but uh, this lecture is going to be really 
a combination of his talent, but also a combination how he related sociologically, anthropologically to his family and friends. And he was a kind soul, and he found a mission in life, and that was painting the Native American Indian and the cause which they head, and he dedicated his life to that, starting when he was 21 years of age. What's his background? Well, on the left you see a screen of the Keene family. His father was considered one of the top engravers in the world, and certainly in the United States. The master's voice, here's another nostalgia point for you. The master's voice is the most collected patent ever viewed of anything in the world, or at least in the United States. So you look at uh, Nabisco, you look at Coca-Cola, you look at all kinds of logos. The master's voice of RCA Victor ranks number one. And he did that. He did the engraving of that, which was an incredible thing. But there are some other pictures up here that I want to mention. Uh, he, he did the design of money. He did for Costa Rica much of the money that they put into effect. And I have some original monies from Costa Rica. But in 1924 was a national convention, Democratic convention in New York. What would happen is the parties, both Republican and Democrat, wanted to collect money from the people who came. So they wanted to have a foolproof ticket, and the foolproof ticket is what he designed, Thomas Jefferson. And that was handed out, and if you didn't have that, you didn't get in. But he went further. The big fight, the first fight involving a $1 million purse and over 90,000 people saw it, and the first radio, bo uh, radio broadcast of a boxing match in the history of the, at least the United States, he designed using an Indian on it. That was the ticket to get in. People were paying up to two to three thousand dollars to see that event. Without the ticket, you didn't get in. So his background, Keene's background, was his father was one of the leading people in in the arts of engraving, which was an engraving was an art. His mother played the piano and also sang. So music and art were two things that were in Keene's blood from a very young age. And he went to the New York, um, uh, New York League of Art, or Arts League, and he studied under George Bellows first, and then he studied under uh, Rice, who was the second. So those two were his mentors in his career, and his paintings reflect a combination of those two. So this is a little background on him, and it shows that art and music was part of his life from a very young age. And when he was at the school in New York, I have uh, some of the paintings of, of his, he did na nature scenes. He wanted to be an Audubon, so he did paintings of birds. And they won first place going through the school in which he was based until 1921, when Rice took him to Montana. So we'll go on from there to the next one, I think. All right, let's hit it that way. He went to Montana uh, with Rice as his teacher and mentor, and he went to a little town in Montana, as you can see up here, Browning. Browning today is the reservation of the Blackfeet tribe, or the Blackfeet nation. But in 1921, it was very small. You see the yellow arrow, it's pointing to a porch. When they got there on the railroad, um, they didn't know where to stay, they had no money. They, they had very little money anyway. So they asked the a person at that hotel if could he stay there? And they said, well, uh, the first night you're going to have to sleep out in the barn with the horses on the hay because we have no room. Remember that story in the Bible? So 
He said to them, sure, we'll be glad to do that. The next day it opened up. But those, all the paintings he did in 1921 and 22, and he was 22 years of age, and he was from New York City. He had never seen anything from the Native American world, but he fell in love with doing these paintings, and the Indians fell in love with him. He did 21 paintings in the first ones, and you have some of the, uh, in the exhibit you'll see tomorrow, some of the earliest works. And that propelled him, as you'll see later, into doing a lot of significant things. But that was, there was no road system there. There was mud, there was rain, and he painted on the porch. The Indians were a little concerned about posing for paintings, but he made them, if you want to pose, uh, you have to wear your Indian clothing, your historical clothing. And slowly but surely, they got proud of that. Now, Curly Bear was the leader of that tri tribe. Curly Bear fell in love with what he was doing and helping the Indian, so he uh, endorsed him to be a member of their tribe, which was unusual for uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon white person to be that loved that early in their career. So the next next graphics is good because this shows him 21 years of age sketching and these Indians stayed and the, every day he did one more of the Indians came and talked among themselves and say hey this guy is a real guy he's not a phony baloney he's something we relate to and that's what I wanted to talk about. It's, it's the sociological, anthropological points of view rather than the classic art, artistic, which you get on almost every docent lecture in most museums. You need to get the humanistic side as, as well. Well, the first exhibit he ever did was at the Mexico, Mex the, Mex the Santa Fe Museum in New Mexico. That's quite an honor because that was the first year it opened. So the curator of that museum says, I want Keene. I want his collection. And those portraits started there and they ended up at the Brooklyn Museum in New York City, but it also went to Los Angeles, San Francisco museums. Uh, it went on to uh, several others beside the Santa Fe. But Leslie Dawn has done a book which won the award in Canada is the best book of, uh, in, in the field of the arts. And he said, this is one of the first art shows in history bridging Indian artifacts with leather, leather beadwork, weaving poetry, teepees with paintings. It was a merging of the cultural opportunities and uh, expressions of Native Americans. So it's something that really took place. And I have the original catalog, and I talked to Hadley, and she has a catalog of that collection. So that got him going in a, a major way. Well, let's talk about his mentor. Uh, Winhold Rice was not an American. He was a German. And like many people in Europe, among other countries, they said, come to America and see a very unique culture, the American Indian. They knew a little bit about cowboys and Indians, but he wanted to study this. So this, this was a very important thing to uh, Winhold. And uh, he ran into Keene after one year and convinced him to enroll in the art school in New York City, which was the prestigious school for painting. And um, he did his works, his first works were done, I call, call it color wax pencils, but they're also called polychromos pencils, but they're, they're not crayons, but if you see, and we have several paintings in our house and people look at it, like it's, it's in disbelief. I don't know how it was done. Well, his paintings, and some are here in that medium, uh, that was his start. Well, Winhold and, and he stayed about a month in this small town and 
Billy wrote his parents, and I have the original letters, saying, what an experience. I've never had anything like this. And I'm committed to helping, working with the Native Americans and preserving what they have as time passes. And that's the way he was his whole life. He was that kind of a genuine person. Now, this picture is a very interesting one here. Because that was done. That was the Glacier National Park. That's very important. But it was sponsored by the railroad, Northern Railroad, the National Park System, before it became, under Teddy Roosevelt, the National Park System as we know today. But that was a way of opening up through cultural means, using art, to get people to come to the West, observe the uniqueness of the West, and it was a form of economic development, publicity, marketing. I mean, it's, those are not crude terms. Because I have a painting at home by uh, a couple people, including, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his name right now, Norman Rockwell, painting orange crush bottles. That's not what was done later, the Coke bottles in the 60s and 70s. So a lot of artists worked in other media to ensure they had enough money to survive. And that's the point I'm trying to make. And Rice, as you'll see in the collection tomorrow, has a lot of pictures of what he did for the Northern Railroad, uh, and he became one of their strongest exhibitors. So travel tourism was a very important aspect of, of the art community. Now this picture on the left, top left, is very unique because it's my grandmother's home called the Green Tavern Inn during the American Revolution. And it's the fourth oldest home in Connecticut. Fourth oldest that's been continually used as a residence. And that's documented by the National Geographic in their 1938 issue on Connecticut. So that's pretty significant. And guess what? When Billy didn't have money, or Uncle Billy, where did, where did he live? He lived in this house. He lived in it for four years. And where did he paint? By a fireplace that was about seven feet tall. And all the meals were cooked in it. Because that was the only heated room in the whole house. So this is important to really see the culture and the, 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 the view of, of society at, at that time. Now, he did traditional, I have the painting on the bottom right, a sketch, and he did those sketches doing classical tree design. But when he finished it, he turned it into an Art Deco trees. And that painting was at the exhibit that we had in Florida. We had 10,000 people at that museum over six weeks. 10,000 people from all over the country. And many people came and said, Dr. Bragdon, we haven't seen any of this work in years, and this is uh, outstanding. So he, had a, he hit a, a positive nerve. Now the next one, this is a, a rendering of the house, both front and back, of the Green Tavern Inn, as it was called. But the aerial view, he did several aerial views, and this is one obviously done in the fall with the beautiful colors. And one thing that's very unique about his work, and we have paintings in our house going back to the 20s and 30s, and the color on those paintings are as good as somebody doing a painting today. Incredible. So the science of color is something that has to be examined. And he did it. He did it that way. So this is the house. And during the Revolutionary War, the troops stayed there. And their, house, their horses were stabled outside on horse posts. And they drank there and slept there. So it's quite a unique background. Moving into something that's very important, uh, the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Now, Uncle Billy was, he read an ad in the newspaper saying, if you're an artist, come to Canada and do a painting, and if you're selected, you'll be used for a major painting that will be a poster to bring 
people to see how the native uh, Indians live in their culture. Well, he went up and did it. And after that, his paintings became so significant in his young years that the president of the Canadian Pacific said, you're selected for 1926, for the 1926 poster. And guess where that poster is today in your collection? It's going to be shown tomorrow. And it is a handsome one. We owned it, and uh, I sold it to the one of the members of our Board of Regents. And he says it's the finest painting he has in his home. And he bows down to it every day. And he has quite a collection. So this is the, the scene. And you see the teepees. He went up and painted from in Morley in Alberta, Canada. And those teepees were, became the renderings for the painting. So he was in Morley, and there's a picture of him in the Banff region painting. He loved it, and he, he spent every year. He traveled over his entire life over 30,000 miles painting Native Americans in their cultural environment, more than any American painter of, um, of, in, of Indian culture in our history. So he's done something that's never been replicated. Now this is an interesting one because Frank Lloyd Wright became enamored with my uncle's paintings. And the word is, and it's been partially validated, that Frank Lloyd Wright made that frame for my uncle. And that is in Catherine, um, my left in the, what color is that you're wearing? Well, whatever it is, pink, whatever. She's from Alexandria, Virginia. She's here today. <coughs> and that is a scene from Stamford, Connecticut. But that is been considered by several a Frank Lloyd Wright frame, which is very, very rare. Okay, moving on. Transportation was important to him, and uh, as you know, shipping started in about 3000 BC, and it was the major form of movement in mobility for a long time, and then rail, as you know, came into fashion, and that's what this exhibit is about. But he did for Kennard uh, several paintings. In fact, he did six travel posters, the one on the bottom left that you can see here is in, in our house. And it was mocked up by the director of marketing and all for uh, Kennard. And he, he wanted these changes. So he wrote things on here, how to deal with it. And on the right is the final. Unfortunately, I don't have a bright picture, but I have that in our collection as well. Now, the next slide shows six of the paintings he did for Canard Ship. And these cover different themes that they wanted to have done. So what I'm suggesting here is that commercialization, Wyeth did this, uh, Rockwell did this, many painters did commercial work to offset what they loved to doing most but didn't get paid for it. And that's, that's what happened in this case. Now the next slide is very interesting because we, we talk about their family. They had one child, her name was Phyllis, but she went by Fifi. And Fifi was a very intelligent young lady, but neither parent wanted her to go with them when they painted or when Helen was working on a manuscript for a book. So poor Fifi, at age four, four and a half, went into a monastery in France, which you see there, and had to speak French for two years. She barely could speak English. And the, the parents visited her, but this was quite a, a shock. But Fifi told me the whole story. Fifi died uh, several years ago, but I was her closest cousin and inherited everything about Billy King 
and that's one reason why I'm so committed to making the Keen story come alive. So this is now the international high school, grades 9 through 12, in France. But she had to cope with a communication problem. Now, the picture on the left is important because that dog came from the president of the railroad. The dog's name was Cop, K-O-P. The president of the railroad gave uh, Billy two dogs. One died, unfortunately, but this one lived, and they took it to Paris on the left bank in their studio. So that's Fifi with her favorite doll, and we have that doll at our house. Don't have the dog, but we have a picture of it, and we have a painting. And the important thing is that became the cover of New York Times. See, this guy was under 30 years of age, and we have at least 12 pictures in the New York Times uh, out of the Paris Bureau or the New York Bureau, or he was either on the front page or the second page. And he was dynamite but he was very nonchalant about what he was doing. He cared what he was doing. So I thought you'd appreciate that. So that was one picture. Here's another one. Um, that was the daughter, I mean the wife of Billy, Helen Keene, who was an interested in writing and also interested in painting. We have several paintings of Helen work, but Helen didn't pass, well, she didn't score. She didn't get around third base the home plate like Billy did. And so there, she was anguished about that. But Rachel, our other daughter here from Dallas, she has that painting in her collection. And it's a beautiful painting. And so beautiful, it was on the cover of New York Times in 1932. And I have the original photographs stamped on the back, New York Times. So this is not a story of, of not a, a, an untrue story, but it's a, tr a story of fact. Now, what did he do when he was over there for two years? He went over there for two reasons. The economy was sour. This was the Depression time. And the word was, if you can get out of the United States and go somewhere else, do it. And so he went to two places. He, he lived in Paris on the left bank, uh, left bank, but he also in the summer left Paris and went to Seville. So this is what he did for two years. And fortunately, his father, who was still successful in, in the trade of, of engraving, was able to put up enough money to help him out. And that's also how Rice got to Montana. Rice didn't have enough money either, nor did Billy, but her, his father helped him out. So parents, you know all about how parents help children. So that, what, what kind of work did he do? Well, th this is a collection of some. The one in the center is my favorite. Again, all these were done with, with colored pencil. And uh, if you see them up close, you can't believe it. You cannot believe the detail. These are hanging in our bedroom. And um, I was told that the one in the center, at least, was at the Louvre for a while. So th this was an incredible collection. And these were all done. These were gypsies or Andalusian women that were painted over a summer. And I think he did 21 of them using this polychromos pencil system. Now, what's important is that he had an exhibit in Paris at the Charpentier, uh, which was considered very close to the Louvre at that time. It was a, ga it was a gallery. It's, it's faded today. But in 1930, he was introduced by the ambassador to the United States from France and the ambassador to France from the United States. And he had 86 of his paintings in that collection, 87, I said Indian paintings, or native, native paintings. 
It was well attended by people all over Europe and the United States. And that was the break he needed to convert his works from having national attention in the United States to having European attention. Collections were purchased in, in France, in England, in Spain, in other places. So almost everything was sold out, but feedback came back to the United States saying, look what he has done. And these paintings are significant paintings. Um, so this just shows you what he did in, in um, Seville, but the top right's an interesting one. That's one that is in a collection of our other daughter who's not here in Darien, Connecticut. But that is a fourth century medieval, earlier than me, medieval church. And it's incredible with the red door. I mean, what a dynamite painting. Now that was done in oil, very rare. And let me just mention, he loved to work with polychromos pencil and all that. He, he really felt comfortable. When he got a contract to do work for the, for the National Geographic, they said, we want you to do these in their, their, their costume of their historical, whatever their historical color, uh, wearing was. And we want you to document the Indians and their background and where they were, their venue and everything. But you have to do them in oil. Billy's knees knocked together for a week. He says, I haven't done an oil painting in five to 10 years. So that's what he, he had to do them all in oil. So he switched, he switched his whole thing to be creative in, in that realm. Well, Fifi came back not knowing how to speak English. She could only speak French. So when she went to school in East Haddam, Connecticut, they thought she was a dumbbell. And they told her that she's going to have to go to a lower grade because she can't communicate. So what did Billy do? What did Billy do? Sign the Alice in Wonderland room. That was on the, not the cover, but it was in the National Geographic, September 1938. So look at a 1938 issue, it was on Connecticut, the state. And that was a picture of Fifi in bed, and that was her bedroom. And all these pictures dealt with Alice in Wonderland, and all of a sudden she got interested in English. And slowly but surely, and my uh, cousin, from Rhode Island, taught her how to speak English using the Alice in Wonderland book. Worked with her for over three months, and slowly but surely she started speaking English. So that is in the house. It's in the house today. It's on the National Register, on the second floor of that house built in 1690. So that's historical art that is helping the family and the whole transfer of French to English. Okay, moving from there, he did lots of things. He received a commission from the federal government to Nathan Hale's life. Now, Nathan Hale, you might not know, was a, a teacher from 1750 to 1790. Is that it? Let's see. 1799. So that means he taught almost 50 years in school, and that was the school he taught in, in Moodus, Connecticut, right near the Chester River. Well, this is the first phase of, of the painting, which was done in a school in Moodus. He did four of them, each one about 10 feet long. The last scene uh, is the British walking down the steps, not the steps, or walking on a path with Nathan Hale erected in a vertical position, I mean a horizontal position, going to lynch him because he was a spy for George Washington. He died. So he was a Yale student, great teacher, and quote, a British spy. 
or American spy, which the Brits decided to get rid of. So Billy did this whole collection. Where is it? It's in the Moodus old school, which was going to be torn down, and they've saved it, and they're trying to figure out how they can make that into an exhibit of national prominence. Well, Billy did other things beside historical scenes. He did Eddie Cantor. He did the governor of, of, uh, of Connecticut in a painting, and he did many others. But he also did covers for magazines. This was the National Gallery uh, covered magazine in, in New York, the you know, Natural History, and he did two of them in one month. So this was in 1935. So what I want to do is go on to something I talked to Hadley about. They have the largest collection of Keene works. They have 105 in their collection. They have, they've lost some. They lost 10. They lost them to me because they said, Dr. Bragdon is his, well, he, he was his uncle. Billy Keene was his uncle. And he, and he deserves, after having a, a museum open with 10,000 people there, he deserves to... So these were in the exhibit. So I asked the Vice President of National Geographic, is it possible I could buy one of Keene's paintings? And he said, you can have all 10. We made an agreement, and I bought them. And guess what happened two months later? National Ge Geographic issued a policy. There will never be a sale of a National Geographic painting again in its history. So I changed the history of the National Geographic. So these paintings, are most of these are in our collection and our family primarily. But what a, an astounding opportunity. And have you, if you had seen them, you would. You have to come to our house. You can see them. Come to Rachel's house. Come to Catherine's house. You will be blown away by the quality of what you see. So moving from that, I want to get into one of my favorites, one bull. One bull was the adopted son of Sitting Bull. Now, Billy painted him in 1947. He was 93 years old. And look how proud he was. Look how proud he was. And he wore exactly what he looked like when he was a Sioux chief. Chief of the Sioux tribe. Look at that. We have that in our living room, and that's my proudest painting of Keene. It's also the preface of the book on Indians of America done by the National Geographic that sold 355,000 copies, more than any book on American Indians in the history of this country. And it was a Keene collection. So this is quite a painting. So here's Sitting Bull. I don't know how many days he stayed there to paint, but you can see he was erect and healthy. So after he did the painting, what did he say to my uncle? Would you like to see the battlefield? The next day, he went and saw the entire battlefield where Custer's last stand was. Entire battlefield. And if you look into the National Geographic, he painted that battlefield from memory and from pictures he did. Now that's quite something, because that's not in any other collection that I know. Well, moving on, he had a studio because he didn't ever do everything on the road, even though he traveled 30,000 miles, but he came back home to Connecticut. And this is Billy in, in his studio, and he's doing a very unusual painting. This is the Lewis and Clark picture of when Lewis and Clark went on their trip to the West. They saw Indians standing down with poles, catching fish, and bringing them back. And the, they were amazed. If you read the Lewis and Clark, you'll, you'll read all about it. Well, he did one of those. This was so su successful that it has been put in many collections. Norman Rockwell Museum in Massachusetts had it for two years. Two years. This painting. And they would love to have it longer. And guess who bought it? I did. And that's why I'm now on the outs with the curator. But that's in the collection of Elizabeth in 
in uh, Darien, Connecticut. It's a powerful painting. It doesn't show up as well as it really does, but that's him painting that painting after he had taken elaborate notes and graphics and so forth. Okay, he did only one painting with himself in a picture, and he used a mirror to do it because he didn't want to showcase himself. He's, he said, that's irrelevant. I'm, not, I'm irrelevant. It's what I paint that's important. So that's the only one, and I gave that to the East Haddam Museum of, of History uh, for their collection because he lived in East Haddam, and they love it. The bottom one is his house. This is in Headline, which is right next to the Chester River, and the woman next door living in that house next door was the first female professor of medicine at any university in the country, and it was Harvard. So that's the quality of people that lived in that area. And uh, it's just wonderful, the creativity that people had. And Padlime Home is still there, but it's not in the condition it needs to be. Okay, I mentioned Indians of the Americas. That was the book that contained 105 of his paintings, all in oil. And that's the number of books that were sold. Now you can go online. And purchase one of these books probably for ten, fifteen dollars. But what a collection of his paintings in one publication. But not only did he do that, he also did some uh, seven monthly issues of the National Geographic, where he wrote the stories and did the paintings. So he was a writer, an anthropologist, a sociologist, and an artist. He merged lots of fields together to do what he did. Okay, moving from that, I want to go to how he related to our family. Every year we got together with Billy, usually in Connecticut, because he was painting all the time. He had no time to go to St. Louis, where I was from, our family was from. So we went to Connecticut. So the top left is my, my dad. And guess what the background is? The Mississippi River, because he's from St. Louis. And he's holding a cigarette with a pack of cigarettes, with a matches. Why? He was vice president of Carter Carburetor. Those are, he put those things in there because it related to how my dad lived. Uh, next to that is my mother. And that was, he did that for her, the wedding present for her when she got married. To the right is my sister Peggy, who she got that when she got married. Uncle Billy did that for her marriage. That's Helen and Fifi Keene, bottom left, that he did in Paris. And guess where that painting is? Rachel has it. And it's one of the most beautiful paintings of a mother and a daughter you'll ever see in your life. And it's so you're going to have to go see Rachel's house. So we'll have to give you the address and everything on that one. Now this one I found Beefy Keen in 1930 when she was in Paris in the, in the convent. And I found that rummaging through an antique store in Connecticut. So very interesting. The last one is Fifi. She went to Northwestern. She majored in... Um, uh, well, she was the editor of the National Geo not National Geo but the Connecticut Historical Society. She majored in journalism at Northwestern, one of the very few women at that time majoring in journalism. That's how strongly she felt about it. And that's why I'm glad we have three daughters, because they're taking the, the bit to do things in a very commendable way. So moving quickly from that, we're almost done. That's Morley, Alberta, when Billy was painting for the, uh, the uh, paintings for the, the, the railroad painting that was the Indians of the America, uh, Indian painting in 1926, the poster, which you'll see in the other room. Now, who is this person down on the bottom left? That's a Yakima who came from Washington on his own found his studio, Billy did have nothing to do with this, found the studio 
And he said, will you paint me? And he says, why? He said, I want to get a job in France, primarily Paris, and I want to learn and, and showcase dance and so forth. So that's what he did. And then he did books. He did 13 books. Uh, he did some very substantial works that were nationally or internationally significant. But these are not only the covers, but the illustrations for the books. And then the Canadian Book of the Year in 2008 was Leslie Dawn's, talking about the Indians that, uh, I mean, the painters of Indians who were not national visions, but should have been. And he says Keene was the most important one, was not recognized. He was recognized in 1921 and 22 by New York Times. Well, what happened after 22, 23, 24, 25? I don't know. Don't know. So uh, we're almost done. He loved Christmas cards and season greetings. So in 25, on the left, you see the one he did. And then he did a church scene, but he never completed the steeples of any church. That was just how he worked. It was just one of his things. He didn't have a first name he ever used. He didn't use all the steeples. OK. This one is interesting because every time he went on a trip, he tried to incorporate the trip with Christmas cards. The first one in 1942 says, making teepees is a lot of work. It usually takes more than one year. And then on the bottom left, his car broke down in 1940 and was pulled out of the desert by an Indian with a rope on his horse. So that's how he got around. And then airplane in 47, it went down three times and he thought he was going to die. And at the fourth time, the engine cooked and it, it worked. And then he cooked, he, he painted in environments that very few painters ever work in. He painted the Arctic Circle 50 degrees below zero. How many artists today would go to a place and paint for two to three weeks 50 degrees below zero? I don't think any. He did that, and, and his paintings reflect that. Some of them do. Okay, quickly, got two more slides. Uh, he was from Connecticut, and he did lots of pictures of the Connecticut River Valley. So after he finished his Indian work and his retirement, he started painting scenes of the Chester River and also all of Connecticut. One important person in his life was Sir Henry Welcome. He was the founder of the Welcome Institute. He said, who cares? At one time, and is still true today, the largest independent charitable organization in the world. Its value is $22.1 billion. And guess what he did? He went to Billy Keene and said, I want you to paint the Indians that you've already painted for me, for the Welcome Institute, which is in England. He painted 80 paintings. And on the bottom, you'll see three of those. So if you go to the Welcome Institute Library, you'll see some of his paintings, which are duplicates of paintings he did, but he wanted these. And, and Billy was broke. He needed to get some money. So that's what he did. Medically, this is important, probably more important than anything else. Uh, he painted the Indians in their natural environment, Native Americans, as they looked, however they looked. When he was up in the British Columbia, he found that a lot of the paintings, the Indians' eyes were almost closed. And so when he met Duncan Scott, who was head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Ottawa, he said, Billy, I love your paintings, but why do you show all these Indians with their eyes almost closed? He says, because half the Indians in Canada are blind, and the other half are going blind. All of a sudden, that, it started a, a major uh, event of, of inquiry. And lo and behold, it turned out that there were some physicians not giving the proper medication to the Indians in British Columbia. So this is the quality of what he did. It was more than art. It was history. It was anthropology. It was environmental medicine, all of it was all on his plate. The last picture 
I don't know if many of you know that Alaska was occupied by the Japanese in World War II. Some of you don't know much about Alaska. At that time it was in a state, but, but it was occupied by the J Japan for over one year. Well, Billy was painting up there, the Aleutian uh, painting work, and you see the bottom left that he completed in 1942. But he completed that painting one month after the Japanese blew up the critical uh, Arctic Circle location of Dutch Harbor, which was, Dutch Harbor is one of the most important places in Alaska today. It was blown up. Billy wrote a letter saying, would you give me permission to finish my painting? And he sent it to the Japanese, and the Japanese allowed him to complete the painting, even though they were occupying Alaska. That's the commitment he made to Native Americans. Okay, just in conclusion, there are some accolades you need to know. He was motivated to document the disappearing Native American culture. Two, he traveled over 30,000 miles and did 35 different indigenous communities, painting over 400 American, North Amer Native American portraits in their historical dress and native environmental setting. Now, if you look at some of the paintings you'll see over here done by Rice, they're not in their Native American costume. Um, most of them are, but they're not all that way. He's the only artist to successfully pursue challenging the sojourn document and the director of anthropology for the Mu Museum of Smithsonian Institute has, mentions it. I mentioned he, he, he uh, denoted the blindness among Native Americans, primarily those in uh, Canada. Well, you, I told you about all the paintings he did, so that was significant, but books, artistic covers, and so forth. He's in galleries all over the world, but I put down some National Gallery of Design, Chicago Art Institute. Nash. This gallery purchased a painting. And was it 19, it's a 1922 painting. So Hadley showed me the painting and it's on the floor. So this museum was one of them. But Los Angeles Museum, San Francisco, Santa Fe, Brooklyn, Oklahoma, well, I mentioned your, your institute. Um, this is a statement that was somewhat important. Keene's 78 portraits is one of the most brilliant exhibits in color that has ever been seen in New York City. It is now being shown in the Anderson Galleries and Portraits of American Indians by Keene under the auspices of the Art Museum of San, Santa Fe. That was written by the New York Times in 1922. At that time, he was 23 years old. The last graphic is, um, this is the anthropologist who said, Keene's artistry and painstaking research have produced the most complete, authentic, and dramatic record of the American Indians ever achieved. And that was written by the anthropologist from Smithsonian who wrote the introduction to the book. So he was a fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts and also American Geography. And he died a happy man, but he lived a, a simple life and he was committed to the Native American, and I promised him before he died that would work, make his work relevant in the world. And that's what I'm doing, and Fifi, who is the daughter, she deserved credit too. So thank you, that's it. Now, I've been told that if you have a question, I'm supposed to repeat it, and then we'll <laughs> respond. So there has to be, it's got to be a question. Yes? Yes? Yep. And the doll was, it dates back to uh, before she went to France. So it was in the late, you have the doll. My wife says, let's get rid of that doll. I said, oh my God, we're not going to get rid of that doll. But it's not in the best of shape. But we have it. Yep. Anybody else? Come on, there has to be something here that stimulates something.
If what? Well, what we did in, in Florida with that exhibit brought people out of the woodwork. A man from Calgary has a collection of 65 king paintings. Eight for the show. And he said, this is the finest exhibit I've ever seen in the country. I'm going to give my collection to the college in, in Canada. So, I mean, I have all kinds of testimonials, but I haven't gone to artistic critics, critics because most artistic critics are not multidimensional. They may know art. Do they know sociology, anthropology, and all these other disciplines? You have holistic people observing art. And that's what I like about what you've done here. You're, you're bringing out things that cultivate more than just a singular look at, at something. But I, I will pursue that because our Leslie Dawn up in Canada, he says, Cliff, there are people all over the world who love his work. I said, let's, that's why I like to do a book on him. Get those pronouncements out so we don't talk about dates that go back in the 20s and 30s, but go up forward. Yeah, that's a good question. But we'll work on it. Yeah, a little work. Anybody else have anything? Yes, sir. Ma'am. Good question. She's asking about the posters that are in the Los Angeles, Los Angeles Public one, Library. One down to here. I don't know if Billy did any artistic posters because he, he did like he did for you know for right. Maybe Hadley can answer where some of those might be. Oh. Well, that's what what's been done here is quite exciting because it, mobility is the most significant thing in our culture. How do you do mobility? It's called transportation. So we need to deal with. I'm working in the field called intermodal transportation, the integration of holistic movement. That's one of our defeats right now. So what you're doing with the travel poster starts to show what travel can do and what it's done in the history of all cultures. And uh, I think this is a great launching point. And I'm, I'm excited we're going to be here tomorrow. And if any of you want to ask a question, I'll be available and I'll be going through the exhibit and question or at least pose a question to me. And I'll try to get an answer. I don't, you know, I'm not an encyclopedia. I don't want to be one. <laughs> Anything else before we adjourn? Okay, well, thanks again for the time.